Thanks, Akil. Um, well, it's a pleasure to, to be talking today. So, as, uh, as we saw in the, in the introduction, I've got two, two main areas of, of research, and, and I'd like to cover both of those today. Because actually, as I, as I sort of think into the future, um, there's, there's a real possibility that um, they will sort of join together at some point in, in the future. Uh, but the two things I'm going to talk about, one is gravitational waves and the other is my work on MEMS gravity sensors or MEMS gravimeters. Um, so I, when I was looking at, at sort of uh, preparing the, the slides, um, I thought it'd be quite useful to give you um, a little bit of background um, if gravitational waves and MEMS gravimeters are not your um, area that you usually work in. Uh, so I've got, I've got a, 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 an introduction on, on both of those um, topics. But then, of course, about half the time, I would like to kind of look, look into the future. And it's quite interesting that the two fields are actually quite dif different. Um, on the gravitational wave side, we actually have quite a robust um, forward-looking plan, uh, maybe sometimes even all the way out to 2050, 2060. Um, and this is not unlike particle physics. So when, for example, you're working on the Large Hadron Collider, Again, you need to know what you're going to be doing in the next 20 to 30 years because you have to apply for funding, you have to put everything in place, you have to do early stage R&D. I think on the MEMS gravimeter side, it's a little bit more flexible. Um, so I think that it's quite interesting to, to kind of compare and, and contrast those, those two areas. Um, so let's start with gravitational waves. Um, so this is a field, I would, I would say that actually the, the field of multi-messenger astronomy which has really come about since the first detections of gravitational waves back in 2015. Um, that really is one of the fastest um, growing areas in, in physics and, and astronomy. Um, just uh, some of the citation rates that we see on, on some of our papers um, is, is truly, truly amazing. Because what we're doing, of course, is we, we're observing sources that have never been seen before. So, of course, this kind of is a really, really great way to to sort of um, develop um, a field um, in, the, in, in, a, in a certain direction. So I've got one slide on what a gravitational wave is, and then a few slides on, on um, what the detectors are, and then just kind of finish up that off by, by looking at where we are currently in the field. Um, so the interesting thing, of course, is gravity, our theory of gravity, is kind of an odd one out in terms of the fundamental forces in, in, in nature. So if you think about what are the fundamental forces, we have um, the strong and the weak force, and um, we've got the electroweak, which is essentially electromagnetism and, and the weak force, and we have gravity. Um, now, of course, the strong and the electroweak force are all quantum theories. So the exchange particle um, is a quantum. It could be a W and a Z boson, or it could be a gluon, or it could be a virtual photon in the case of electromagnetism. Um, gravity is a, a little bit of an odd one out. It's classical. It, is really depends on the, the curvature of space and time. So as you see there in, in the picture, I've got this mass and an object sitting in that space time creates local curvature. And it's the motion of objects in that curved space time that we see as the gravitational interaction. Um, now, of course, we, we don't have a quantum theory of gravity, but general relativity works fantastically well. Um, but it's probably, uh, if we think about the grand unified theory, it's just part of a step on the way to this sort of bigger, bigger picture. Um, so when we think about gravitational waves and we've got oscillations or, or, or movements, you know, let's take two objects like two black holes and they're orbiting around one another like this. Um, and as they spiral together, they may be orbiting one another, 30 solar mass objects at about 300 times per second, moving at about 0.9 times the speed of light. And as they coalesce, they send out these ripples in curvature of space-time, this fabric in which we, we, we live. Um, and this is what we see as gravitational waves. And we know now that those travel at the speed of light. And I'll show a little bit later why we think, why we, we know that's the case. Our detectors measure this thing called strain. So this is a dimensionless number. And, and one of the reasons why it's been about a hundred years since the prediction of gravitational waves from actually Einstein's theory um, to actually the de detection is that this value of H is a truly, truly small number. So it requires technology at the, at the ultimate level. So we need a network of detectors. And of course, this is something that when we kind of planning for the future, this is really important. But where we are at the moment, we've got two detectors in the US. So these are called the LIGO detectors. So 
the LIGO is Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. We've got a detector in Germany, and that was built between University of Glasgow and uh, University of Hanover. And then there's a detector in uh, Italy, near Cascina, that's called Virgo. And then a detector underground working at low temperature, which came online just at the end of the, the last science run. And there's a third detector, uh, in which I, I do a lot of work at, is a third LIGO detector that's going to be built in, in India, um, probably around 2026, maybe 2029. So already we're starting to see we're, we're moving about eight, eight, nine years uh, ahead of ourselves. But you need a network of detectors because the way that we observe sources and localize them is by time of flight. So depending on when the gravitational wave arrives in the LIGO detectors or the Virgo detector, we can actually put a point on the sky to around 20 square degrees. And you'll straight away know that 20 square degrees, if you tell an optical telescope to, to point there and find the source, it's a pretty tough thing to do. So this is one of the things we want to do, more detectors, better detectors, really reduce that localization so we can do better astrophysics and follow up. Um, the detectors in terms of the technology are just remarkable. Um, they're laser interferometers. So the LIGO detectors are um, a set of arms and these arms are four kilometers long and we split the light into, into, into roughly half and half the light goes down one arm, half the light goes down another arm. And what we're doing is we're measuring the time of flight of the photon. So we, we essentially, we know that speed of light is an invariant quantity. So the time it takes a photon to go down the X arm versus the Y arm, as a gravitational wave comes in and changes the proper distance, then we start to see either constructive or destructive interference in the output port. But what we have to do is we have to measure over this four kilometers, differential arm length shift to roughly a thousandth of the diameter of the proton, so 10 to minus 18 of a meter. And of course, that's one of the reasons why this has been um, a real experimental feat that really the experimental work started in the 60s. And here we are now in, in 20, so 2020. So you can see that it's taken 60 years to get from the kind of early prototype experiments all the way up to these long baseline detectors that are now detecting gravitational waves. So that gives you a, a feeling of the, of, of the length of time that it takes to do this, this R&D. Um, Another way to put it, I mean, I, I find a thousandth of the diameter of the proton over four kilometers quite hard to, to, to imagine. Um, it's, it's also kind of like measuring the distance of the nearest star, which is Alpha Centauri, four light years away, to the width of a human hair. And again, I, I'm sure you'll, you'll appreciate that that really is a truly remarkable experimental feat. Um, so this is what the detectors really look like. Um, so the three detectors that the that have been sort of the workhorses since 2015, the first detections. Um, the first detections were made by the two LIGO detectors, and those are um, located in the, the, um, the, the state of Washington, so near Hanford, and down in Livingston in Louisiana, and they're about 3,000 kilometers apart, so it takes light, traveling at the speed of light. Um, if you could travel through the Earth, it would take you about 10 milliseconds. Um, so this is why we use timing to actually work out the, the position on the, on the sky. Um, so, of course, if you can increase that baseline by putting in a Virgo detector sitting in Italy, then you increase that to maybe 20, 30 milliseconds. Even better if you can put a detector in um, maybe in India, and then it goes up to about 40, 45 milliseconds. Better still, and we haven't done this yet, but this is another thing for the future, is put a detector in Australia because then you're really getting a southern hemisphere detector, you have exquisite sensitivity and you start to really resolve down to maybe sub one, one degree squared on the, on the sky. Um, the technologies, there's, there's, there's endless possibilities of, of future work there, but the technology is remarkable. Um, so the, the, there's a, a variety of different noise sources that we have to worry about and, and combat in order to, to make these tiny, tiny measurements um, so, of course, the ground shaking and where, where LIGO starts operating, the ground shaking about 100, um, well, typically 10,000 million times more than we want. So we have to develop these um, in vacuum. So these are, these are systems that, that go into a vacuum system. They have to provide seismic isolation. On the bottom of that, we suspend this multiple stage pendulum, and that's the mirror that senses the gravitational wave. And all of this bottom bit of the suspension is made out of glass, fusilica. 
And this is what we build in Glasgow. So I lead the activity to build these, what we call fused silica suspensions. And the reason we make these things out of glass is to, to lower um, the contribution due to thermal noise. So what we worry about is we worry about thermal fluctuations in the material damaging our one thousandth the damage of a, of a proton. The lasers are remarkable. So the lasers are um, 100 watt neodymium YAG lasers um, working at 1064 nanometers. Um, they are the most powerful, most quiet laser sources in, in the world, which makes LIGO the most sensitive length measuring device in the world. But what we do is, um, some of you on the call I'm sure will have um, maybe even used or working on squeezing. Um, so in, in LIGO, um, this is really one of the areas where we can't necessarily just easily turn up the laser power. Because um, if you turn up the laser power, then it becomes much, much more uh, difficult to control these mirrors. We get heat absorption onto the surface of the mirrors. So we actually use squeeze light. So we put into the dark port of the interferometer, we use um, shot noise squeezing or phase squeezing of, of light. And one of the things we'd like to do in the future, of course, for the next generation detectors, is also, as well as doing the shot noise squeezing, of course, that means that at high frequency you get improved performance, but you get anti-squeezing or worse noise at low frequency because you get radiation pressure noise. So one of the things that will come online probably in the next five to 10 years is frequency dependent squeezing, whereby we have a filter cavity in LIGO and we actually rotate the squeezing ellipse at low frequency. So we can do phase squeezing at high frequency and amplitude squeezing at, at low frequency. So these are some technologies where, where we really touch a broad community. So we, of course, touch the optomechanics community, the photonics community, and, and we're very open to collaboration in the, in the gravitation waves. Um, let me just show you very briefly the sources and, and a couple of highlights. I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but this was the first detection in 2015. And of course, this made worldwide headlines. So this was looking at the, the final um, kind of in spiral, you know, last two or three in spirals of that binary black hole system, roughly 30 solar masses. And as I said earlier, those things are, are, are coalescing, they're, they're rotating about 300 times per second um, when they, they finally merge, and they're moving at about 0.9 times the speed of light. So it's the most luminous event that had ever been detected. About three solar masses went into the fabric of space time to create these ripples that, that then move through the universe for the next sort of billion years and then we picked up the last point one of a second in, in the LIGO detectors. Um, so remarkable um, events but of course the field needs to move past you know a detection. I mean detection is fantastic but you want to do astrophysics and you want to use these objects, um, these detectors as a, as a new form of, of astronomy. So essentially what we're doing is we're kind of pushing open the gravitational window on the universe. So we've got electromagnetic window and now we've got a gravitational wave window and those two combined are extremely powerful. Um, these are some of the sources and even if we don't know much about gravitational waves, what we can see here is they all look a little bit different. So you've got the first one at the top, which is, we call these GW150914. So the numbers are, are the US date. So it's the 14th of September, 2015. And you can see that's quite a short event. Then you got this one, this was called a LIGO Virgo trigger. It wasn't quite statistically strong enough to be a detection, but you can see it's a little bit longer. And then this was the next event, which was observed on the 26th of December, um, 2015. And this is a much longer event. So this is a heavy mass, a lighter and a lighter still. So by looking at the, the length of time the system sits in band, as it's a lighter system, it, it, it coalesces at a, at a higher frequency. Um, then you've got some other detections. Um, and again, those are sort of midway between the, the heavy one and the light one. But this is an interesting one. This looks completely different. So this is GW170817. So all of these ones up here, these are binary black holes. This one here is a neutron star, neutron star pair. So it's two neutron stars spiraling around one another. And of course, neutron stars, well, we thought that the, the, the heaviest mass they could get to was maybe 1.4, 1.8 times the mass of the sun. We're now seeing interesting evidence that there's objects that could be very heavy neutron stars or very light black holes. But you can see here the system sort of spiraling, it stays in band about 100 seconds before it coalesces. So you're getting a huge amount of information. If you do match filtering and actually lock into that signal, 
he can actually extract remarkable astrophysics. Um, so this, this was very interesting, GW170817, the, um, the neutron star in spiral, um, because this was the, you can just about see here, the LIGO, um, the, what we call the chirp, moving through the band as a function of time and frequency here. So it coalesces up at a, um, maybe about five, 600 hertz. But you can see here, it's, it's not very easy to see with the, with the slides, but you can see here a little pulse. And what that says there is it says Fermi GRB. So this is a gamma ray burst. So not only did we see a gravitational wave signature, but we saw a flash of gamma rays. And this was picked up in two satellites. And they were co coincident. Um, so this, this sort of set the community, um, the, ast the astronomy community, every single telescope on the planet and also in space started to point and start doing observations in this patch of sky where we thought the object was. And um, it, it was tracked down to a, to a galaxy that's um, consistent about 40 megaparsecs away. So the host galaxy, um, in terms of light travel time, is about 100, 150 million light years away. And it's remarkable that these, the gra gravitational wave signature, when this coalesc coalescence happened, and the gamma ray burst, these happened within about 1.7 seconds of one another. So over 150 million years, light and the and, and, and speed of gravity are the same to roughly a part in 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16. And of course, the uncertainty then is when does the gamma ray, when does the gravitational wave, when do they get, get emitted? Uh, and then you can see all the other telescopes starting to see um, signals. Um, and what happens is this neutron rich material from the, from the neutron star in spiral, it essentially sort of blasts out into the interstellar medium. So it's, um, this, this is a process of making lots of heavy elements. Um, so as you can see here on the periodic table, um, there's, there's now a, 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 an entry for merging neutron stars. So all of these elements here, which we know we can't form above iron unless we go into a, into a supernova. So now merging neutron stars create significant amounts of these heavy elements. Um, so, so this is really multi-messenger astronomy. It's combining the two together. So gravity and electromagnetic observations. So I think this is an area that's going to you know, blow, blow, blow apart even further than, than it has now in, in the future as new detectors come online, better electromagnetic telescopes come online. So that's, that's kind of where, where I, I, I want to finish just the gravitational wave portion. And then, of course, we'll look in the future in a bit. Um, but this is, this is remarkable. So this is over the last sort of four to five years. So the purple ones were the black holes that we observed from electromagnetic observations. So it might be optical in the center. It might, might be, um, um, or, 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 or we've got um, our, our neutron stars, which might come from electromagnetic observations, so like pulsar observations. Um, and you can see now that LIGO and Virgo, which are the blue ones, are seeing a huge population of binary black hole systems, more than we, we really expected. So now what we're doing, of course, is we've got whole catalogs. We're understanding the astrophysics, the hierarchy of, of binary black hole systems. We're now starting to see what we call these intermediate mass black holes. And we're really testing the theory of how do these heavy systems form? Because it's not really clear from the astronomy point of view, because as these black holes sort of form and merge, they then get a kick. So often they get kicked out of the clusters that they're sitting in. So the question then is, we know there's really heavy ones at the center of galaxies. We know we can make sort of 100 to a few hundred solar mass objects. How do you fill in that in-between region? So, so the idea is that we use these observations to shed further light, and this is why we want to broaden the, the spectrum. Um, we also see neutron stars, and we're seeing objects that are sitting in this kind of previously thought mass gap, where there was neutron stars and black holes, and there was this region where there's nothing. But actually, LIGO is starting to see events, LIGO and Virgo, we're starting to see events in this region. So this is really exciting. Okay, let me change topic briefly and talk to you about MEMS. Um, so this is an area that I started um, with a colleague in engineering about sort of six, seven years ago. Um, and, and essentially what we did was we, I, I took the, my expertise in optomechanical systems from the gravitational wave community and combined that with my colleague in engineering who had expertise in micro nanofabrication. And we, what we did was we built um, microelectromechanical sensors or MEMS devices, which had sufficient stability and sensitivity to measure the earth tides. 
So the earth tides are, well, we know the water tides, and the water tides are due to the periodic um, tidal potential due to the moon and the sun. And of course, the tidal potential means that we kind of stretch out the, the water, and then the earth spins underneath, and you see two, two tides a day. Well, the, the, as well as the water moving, the solid earth stretches and shrinks. Um, and of course, as, as the earth stretches and shrinks, that means we move further away from the center of the earth. So the local acceleration of gravity also changes. So these are called the earth tides. And they're small effects, but they're, they're typically about um, maybe, maybe sort of um, 10 times bigger than the, the, the signals that you might want to observe if you're doing what we call gravimetry. So we published this in Nature um, back in um, 2016. And this really sort of started off a, a new field of, of uh, potential for light, cheap, gravity sensors. And, and I think there's going to be a, a real sort of longer term journey for, for this activity. And, and that's what I'll share with you a little bit later. Um, but where we are at the moment. So, um, of course, I said that as you move further away from the center of the Earth, well, we know that if, if the Earth was, was um, spherical, it isn't quite, but let's assume the Earth is spherical, then we know that local acceleration of gravity, little g, would be um, gm over r squared, where g is the Newtonian constant of gravity. And that's just by equating the acceleration m little g must be gmm over r squared with the force of gravity. Um, so if you differentiate that with height, we get this expression here. And we're saying that as we move away from the center of the Earth, gravity must get weaker. Um, so you can do a test. And um, we've done a test with our device. We've put it into a lift. And we've gone from the, from the, um, the bottom floor um, up different floors to the top floor and then back down again. And you can see that gravity does in fact get weaker as you go up, up, upwards. Um, so this could be up in a lift and we call this free air effect, or it could be going up a hill. Um, and uh, when you go up a hill, you have to be a little bit careful because you're sitting on mass that's lifting you up. So you've got a gravity pulling you down also. But you can tell also that these floors, the third, the fourth and the fifth floor, a little bit further away from the lower floors. Um, and that's just the way that our building is constructed. So what we're doing is we're starting to build gravity sensors that are you know, kind of handheld. Um, but they can actually start to measure gravitational accelerations that, that are in test for the surveying companies, for example. And, and one of the challenges currently is that gravimeters that we use um, to do surveys, and we do use gra gravity surveys, they typically cost about 80 to 100,000 pounds. So this really limits in your ability to deploy arrays of sensors. So we think making small, cheap sensors is a real transformative technology in the future. So this is where we are currently. And of course, I'll talk a little bit about where we're going in the future um, and where other groups might go in the future. But we are starting to get these devices out into the field. And one should never underestimate the challenge of getting a device from, from the lab into the field because it's tough outside. Um, you don't have any mains power you can plug into. The temperature changes are, are quite extreme. Um, the environmental challenges are, are, are difficult, the humidity, the pressure. So we, 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 we're kind of halfway through that, that journey at the moment. And this is supported under the National Quantum Technology Programme. Um, but we've got really good data at the moment. So now we've measured Earth tides over some 20 days. And you can see the once per day and twice per day signal. So we, we, we now essentially putting our systems into uh, more and more harsh environments to do gravity surveying. Okay, I think that's probably enough for where we are currently. Let's kind of change a little bit and think, well, what about the future? So I've split this is both into future of gravitational waves and future of MEMS. Um, so as I said at the start that I think the gravitational wave fields um, is actually unique, maybe apart from, from uh, well, nuclear physics and particle physics are probably similar. We, we do have this really long-term vision of what we want to do. <laughs> it's always good to look back and say, you know, di did we do what we thought we'd do? Um, so this is a few years back. This was the observing plan that we, we kind of were, were proposing within the LIGO scientific collaboration. And you can see here this sort of phased approach. And, and really, this is what has happened. Um, so in early, this was called observing run one. And this is when we, we observed the first um, signals. And then there was a observing run two and observing run three. And then the design sensitivity would yeah, probably be observing run four. Um, and you can see that as you go down, you improve the sensitivity of the detectors. 
ideally hitting the design sensitivity, which is the black, black line here. Um, so this, of course, in the early days, you wouldn't put as much power in the detector. So at this high frequency, shot noise is a little bit higher than you want, and then you go to full power. Um, so what we found, of course, is we found it's actually rather hard to put high power into gravitational wave detectors. So what we did do is we changed our mind and we said, well, as well as doing the high power, we'll implement squeezing earlier than we thought as well. So we are actually sort of getting down within a factor of two or three of this design sensitivity by utilizing higher power, but a combination of squeezing as well. The, the, the challenge where the uncertainty, you can see this is much wider here. Low frequency is much, much harder because there's a lot of noise sources at low frequency that, that cause issues. And that's everything from seismic noise to, we've, we've shown that you can isolate seismic noise, but seismic noise is density perturbations in the ground. And density perturbations pull on your test mass gravitationally and you can't shield those. So this is called Newtonian noise. Um, so you can see at low frequency, it's a really challenging environment. So, so the detectors find it a little bit harder at, at these, these low frequencies. So I would say that we're, we're probably running a few years, you know, maybe two or three years behind where we expect it to be. So we're not at design sensitivity, but certainly at the high frequency, we're only a factor of maybe two or three away from design sensitivity. Maybe the low frequency is more like a factor of 10 to 20. Um, so of course, what the current plan, um, you can see this all the way out to next next few sort of 10 years, let's say. So I call this the shorter term. Um, so I think really the shorter term is gonna be focusing on upgrades to the current detectors. So we've got LIGO in the US, we've got Vertigo, we've got Kagler that's come online in Japan. And what's gonna happen there is we're gonna really do upgrades of those detectors. Um, so it might be um, that we're changing out for better mirrors. And we're doing that at, at the moment, actually. So in the LIGO detectors, they currently have some downtime. We're putting in better mirror coatings. Um, we, we might improve the masses. So we, we, we realize those issues with um, the gap between our, our, our mirror mass and what we have called the reaction mass. So we, we had what's called squeeze from damping. So we've made an annular design and we've now put that in. We might be improving the laser performance, putting in a new laser system, improving the squeezing, putting in frequency dependent squeezing. These are all sort of more near term activities. And on top of that, LIGO India also. And it's not exact, I mean, I, I would say that probably it's gonna be a little bit later than this. LIGO India has currently acquired all of the land, but I think the current climate and the, the, the lockdown has mean that um, you know, experimental physics has, has really um, been a little bit more challenging than, than we might have expected. So that might push out another three years. So I'd imagine by 2030, LIGO India is online and working with the other detectors. But that's what I would call near term. What about the longer term, which I think is really interesting. Um, so this is not a very kind of pleasant plot. It's just a, a bunch of lines, of course. Um, a little bit later, I'll, I'll talk around this in a bit more detail. Um, so here we've got the advanced detectors, so advanced Virgo, advanced LIGO, and there might be um, different upgrades. So that was the start. This would be what's called advanced um, A+, and we're working on A+, at the moment. This is improving by another factor of maybe three, the design sensitivity of LIGO. So this is happening in the next 15 years. Um, we've got geo high frequency, which is running at the moment. That's probably not going to run a lot longer because, of course, the geo detector is much shorter arms than, than the LIGO or the Virgo detector. So it's, it's very hard for it to, to compete in the longer term. So that might be decommissioned. We've got Kagler that's coming online and improving sensitivity. And then we've got these other ones which we haven't really talked about and I'll, I'll spend some time discussing those. So Mega and Tobar, so those are essentially torsion pendulum devices to, to access the low frequency. So there's some work going on in Australian National University. Um, so so a, a pair of torsion bars um, which sort of swing like this at low frequency, maybe 20 millihertz, um, the, the gravitational wave tidal force will cause those, those this is sort of looking on, down from the top, will cause those bars to swing together or swing apart depending on the gravitational wave. And if that gravitational wave is low frequency, then what we'll find is that those bars will respond um, below their resonant frequency to, to, that, to that tidal force. Um, we've got Cosmic Explorer. So this is a long baseline detector proposed in the US 
maybe in the 2030 regime. We've got the Einstein telescope, that's a European long baseline detector. So what we call, these ones are called 3G or third generation detector. And CAGRA is also, it's almost third generation because it's underground and cold, whereas LIGO and Virgo are on the ground and operating at room temperature. And also there's a step in here that we might do with LIGO and that's called LIGO Voyager, which is a cryogenic version of LIGO in the four kilometer arms. And then we've got space-based detectors. So LISA Pathfinder has happened. ELISA, Enhanced LISA, is working towards a launch maybe 2032, 2035. So these are the sort of next sort of 20 years out. Um, it's really to kind of expand the, the, the field. So what we want to do is make sure we cover the entire space so we've got the ground-based detectors working from 10 hertz up to a kilohertz. Um, then we've got LISA, which is filling in this sort of lower frequency region from maybe um, 0.1 millihertz up to a hertz. And as you go down to the left, you see heavier and heavier systems. Then you've got pulsar timing. So there's a number of um, ob ob um, observatories around looking what's called the International Pulsar Timing Array. Very sadly, of course, the Arecibo um, recently um, um, collapsed. So sadly, that's no, no longer part of the, the network. But these are looking at supermassive black holes in the, in the core of galaxies. And then you go all the way back to the age of the universe, or one over the age of the universe, and you've got the cosmic microwave background, which 300,000 years after the Big Bang, and imprinted on that could be cos um, cosmic gravitational wave signals. So a lot of the focus is about spanning out the, 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 um, the, the field. So this is cosmic exploring the Einstein telescope. So Cosmic Explorer is planned 40 kilometer detector in the US. And as you can see here that from now, we're doing a lot of work on, 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 on the R&D. And it does take typically 15, 20 years to do the R&D properly. So you can see all the things here about suspending, this might be 200 kilogram masses rather than 40 kilograms in LIGO. Um, might be improved squeezing. So lowering the losses in squeezing, higher power lasers, maybe different wavelength lasers. For cryogenic operation, we're looking at different materials like silicon and sapphire. So it's new, new materials which work well at low temperature. Um, it might be 123 Kelvin. And, and this is a place where silicon has a zero thermal expansion coefficient. So it's a really interesting material. And then in, in, in Europe, which um, there's currently a site selection ongoing, um, there's potentially two sites, one down in, in Sardinia and one up in the, in the border between Belgium and, and Germany and the Netherlands. But it's a triangular type detector and we have both warm and cold interferometers and this is 10 kilometers on, a, on an arm. So this detector will be underground very much like drilling out tunnels like was done in CERN. Cosmic Explorer will probably be an on-ground detector but maybe with burying the, um, the, the end test masses in the sides of mountains to reduce the low frequency seismic noise contribution. So these are, these are the, the, the ground-based activities ongoing. In space space, as we move down the, the frequency range, the LISA Pathfinder, um, well, that was launched, as we saw on, the, on the, the, um, the plot previously, and it had fantastic performance. So it actually met over the majority of the frequency band, the LISA requirements. So there's a real push now to launch LISA, and LISA will look at these really low frequency sources. So the ones that you can't access on the ground because of seismic noise, Newtonian noise, in space, what you do is you have these freely floating cubes, which arm lengths maybe a million kilometers, and you're measuring across that arm length to about a picometer. So you start to look at a new type of source. And the really exciting thing here, of course, is that you can take um, a signal in the, in the LISA band, and it tracks through into the LIGO band. So you can see LIGO, and here's LISA. So here's sources, and you can see here there's a, there's a 10 year plot. So you can observe a source in LISA and 10 years later, you know exactly where it's going to be in LIGO. So you can, you can be ready for that detection. And then wouldn't it be even great, um, better if we could fill in this region as well. And there's other, other technologies that, that are looking to, to detect that. So, so it's all about kind of widening out the band in terms of the gravitational wave community. And that could happen with, um, as we've seen here, um, well, of course the BICEP experiment um, did announce a, an observation a few years ago, which turned out later to be related to synchrotron ra radiation um, in, the, in, in the galaxy. So BICEP2 was, was conceived um, with a multi-bandwidth antenna, so different frequencies to try to 
to be more robust against what I call foreground emission. But BICEP's really looking for imprints of the gravitational wave signature on the cosmic microwave background. So what are called these B modes of polar polarization. We've got the pulsar timing array. So really the way this works is that you observe um, a pulsar, which is a really accurate clock. Of course, it has a glitch, but it's a very accurate clock. It goes tick, 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 tick. As a gravitational wave passes through the local interstellar medium, then the timing of that pulsar will actually change because the, the proper distance changes. So what you're doing is you're looking for statistical variations in the arrival rate of, of pulsar times. Um, and of course, the question here um, is, you know, if you talk to someone in the community, maybe in the next 10 to 15 years, there'll be an observation. I think the question is, how good is a pulsar timing at these really low frequencies? So when you're observing it for one to 10 years, you know, is it really flat, what we call white noise, or does it have a, a one over F or, or a colored noise component? Um, there's a lot of work going on in atom interferometers. Um, so alternative technologies um, to laser interferometers. Um, so rather than using test masses, you use freely falling atoms and you probe those atoms. And if you have a bunch of atom interferometers, which can act as radiometers, then you can actually get um, gravitational wave measurements. And there's a, there's a prototype ongoing in, in France called MIGA. And yeah, maybe over the next 10 to 15 years, you'll see that those prototypes will be developing mature, maturing in their technology, just in the same way that the gravitational wave community had in the 70s and 80s, short baseline detectors, which then sort of develop into the, into the longer baseline systems. Um, there might be detectors on the moon, and there's already a couple of proposals coming out for maybe putting seismic arrays onto the moon. You know, lots of people want to go back to the moon. But if you look at the normal modes of the moon, then those get perturbed as gravitational waves come through. So if you have seismic networks on the moon, you can then actually start to do uh, measurements of gravitational waves. And the moon's an interesting place because it's much quieter than the, than the Earth. The Earth is, is noisy because it's got an ocean and it's got what we call micro seismic noise. It's got a lot of plate tectonics, earthquakes, whereas the moon is actually much, much um, more, more benign environment. It's a much more challenging environment to get to, of course, because you have to get into space and, and deploy these things remotely. Um, so I think the goal is really to, to kind of close up this band and you can see LIGO, you can see Einstein telescope, cosmic explorer will be similar, maybe a little bit lower. You can see LISA sitting in here and you can, you can see ELISA, you can see the, um, the, the pulsar timing. So we're filling in this sort of whole spectrum from 0.1 millihertz, which is LISA. We've got MEGA, which could be a gravitational wave um, atom interferometer type thing experiment. And then you've got the ground based experiments. And these sources would be sort of moving through this band. So you'd see them in all the different bands and then they coalesce in the LIGO bands. So this is really very exciting. Um, let me just finish with a few slides on, on MEMS um, and then happy to take any, any questions. Um, so I think it's, it's probably well known at the moment that gravity is a very useful tool in surveying. Um, but it hasn't really, I would say it hasn't fulfilled its, its true potential. And it's always interesting to think and, and look, look at, you know, why is that the case? Um, and it's used in a variety of areas. So oil and gas use gravity. So they might fly over a survey site. They might then go down onto the ground, do seismic surveys, gravity surveys. Um, could gravity be used in navigation? Well, we know already that we use inertial navigation systems. So we measure accelerations and we measure rotation accelerations. And by integrating that, we can get fixes in our location. And isn't that great when GPS goes down? So of course, this is, this is a, 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 an important, you know, you could, even when you're going under a tunnel, you could, you could know where you are. Um, so this could be quite useful for the civil engineering community. Um, in seismic surveys, um, we use gravity um, significantly to, to look at the, the, the reflections of the seismic waves off salt domes, for example. Um, security and defense, um, so at ports of entry or digging tunnels under the ground or maybe submarines under the water. Um, well, of course, gravity can't be shielded. So if you can measure gravity, this is of, of, of real interest. So you might be able to determine, is there someone crawling through a tunnel? Or at my port of entry under the water, 
is uh, is are we in close proximity to to a uh, to an underground mass anomaly? Um, environmental monitoring. So I would say gravimeters and gravimetry is used reasonably um, quite often in, in this technology, but it's always usually single instruments which are moved around the volcano. And then similarly in civil engineering, well, if you can detect sinkholes or old mine shafts, then you won't necessarily go and build on them. And one way of doing that is with gravity. So there's lots of areas of application, but I think the real challenge at the moment is that the devices are either too bulky, too heavy, or too expensive. And that's really what's limited um, the use of gravity as, as a surveying tool. Um, so as I say, the Syntrex CG5 or what's CG6 nowadays, that's typically 80 to 100,000 pounds. So that means you're not gonna put 10 to 50 of them onto the side of a volcano and leave them there because it's just too expensive. As a civil engineer, you might rent a, uh, an instrument to do a survey, but surveys are expensive because they take a, someone that knows what they're doing a significant amount of time. And then also in the security and defense, there's a lot of interest, but really gravity hasn't actually been used in, in, in um, a lot. Maybe in the US Navy, so, so for example, in submarine navigation, so gravimetry and gradiometry have been taken up in, in, in a little bit more. So at the moment, I don't think that these sort of areas have really be, fulfilled their potential. And what it really needs is a sensor that's lighter, cheaper, can easily be deployed in order to do that. So that's why I think that the, the community is going. Um, just to give you an example, so I would say Mount Etna is one of the, the, the most highly um, sort of monitored volcanoes in the world. Um, it's in close lo locality to Catania, um, which is the city just down onto the south e southeastern flank. Um, but even here, you, you have sort of single gravity stations and those gravimeters get moved around. So what we're doing in the next five years, and what I would see would happen in the next five to 10 years, is putting down large arrays of sensors onto the side of, of volcanoes. So we, we have a project together with a, a, a European partners to do that in the next sort of five years. Um, and, and as I say there, I think the real barrier at the moment is cost of sensors. Um, if you can drive those down by a factor of 20, and we think we can do that in the next five years, so rather than 100,000 um, 100, pounds, they might cost 5,000 pounds. And then that means, well, you might have rather than one sensor, you might have 20 sensors. You might be the same outlay, but you just have 20, 20 monitoring points. And that will either speed up your surveys or just give you much better understanding of what's under your feet. And of course, for volcanoes, what we're trying to do is monitor the magma plumbing or the magma move movement in the volcano to understand is that, is there a way of identifying a precursor to an eruption? But I think looking even further ahead, I think you know, clearly with the, the development in terms of micro um, machining, electronics, you know, everything's becoming smaller, cheaper, lighter. I would like to think that you could push that down even by a factor of, of 100. Um, so you're pushing below the 1,000 pounds. Maybe um, if you talk to, I mean, we just done a market survey if you talk to some end user that they'd like to see them 100 pounds and then they really become more like sort of throw away deployable sensors and this completely changes the way that gravity surveys are done so if you can get devices down to the sub one 1000 pounds then you completely change the market if you've got light sensors that you can put onto drones you completely change the market because now you can actually survey in a completely different modality than, than you can do now um, it's not just MEMS-based systems. So the MEMS-based system I talked about is a classical system again. So it's just a mass on a spring, but there's other ways of, of uh, measuring gravity. Um, so there's the MEMS on the, the, the mass on the spring MEMS device is what's called a relative gravimeter. So we monitor gravity relative to a spring. And of course, if the spring changes due to temperature effects, then we see that as a change of gravity. There are absolute gravimeters and there's devices that work by throwing up and down a mass. And again, those systems are typically um, 200,000 pounds. They maybe weigh 150 to 200 kilograms. Um, there's also atom gravimeters. So atom gravimeters you see on the, on the right-hand side there, this is essentially a chamber where you have um, six lasers at the top and they sort of cool a, a cloud of atoms 
of rubidium, and then they let them drop in the gravitational fields. And then you, at the bottom, you have another set of lasers that interrogate the clouds. And what you can do is you can actually measure local acceleration of gravity, but with an absolute um, measure. And of course, you have to stabilize your lasers. Uh, and that's what's all in this box is the electronics to run the lasers in here. But there's a company in, in, uh, in France called Muquons that we're working with. And they've recently installed one of these sensors onto Mount Etna. Um, what I see happening is that other, other quantum gravimeters, so I call these, these are called absolute quantum gravimeters, um, they're still large and bulky, so they typically take a few hundred watts, 100 kilograms, so they're, they're not very portable. Um, but maybe in 10 years, that'll come down to 20 kilos. Maybe in 15, 20 years, that comes down to less than five kilos. With the kind of drive of making more compact laser sources, better electronics, um, the ability to run these sensors in the field, running off batteries rather than the generator that they need currently. Um, there's a big push in the UK to do that. Of course, the quantum technology hubs and the National Quantum Technology Programme. So the Birmingham hub are, are developing both gradiometers and, and gravimeters based on atom clouds. And of course, in the US, there's a lot of work out of Stanford on building these systems. But these are, these are real, again, if you can get the size, weight and power, I think this is the key thing to, to make them game changers in the, in the market. And I think what's going to happen ultimately is we're going to have lots of MEM sensors, which are really cheap, and they're probably always going to be cheaper than the, than the absolute quantum sensors. But the thing with the quantum sensors, it gives you an absolute measurement of gravity, whereas your, your MEM sensors are always relative. So if you have 100 MEM sensors, they might all drift a little bit differently. You somehow need to kind of lock those back to, to your, your, your absolute standards. Um, maybe someone will come up with a, with a plan to make an absolute MEMS gravimeter. Um, and we're kind of working in that way. We've got some plans and some thoughts, but it's probably going to be another five to 10 years before those really, really come to, to fruition. I think understanding the performance and how these MEM systems drift relative to, to, to the absolute systems is also going to be really important. So I think there's a, I mean, everyone loves to talk about machine learning, um, but I think in terms of understanding how temperature and environmental factors couple into these MEM systems is going to be really, really important. Um, so I think I'll just about finish there, other than what I would really like to see with, with gravity is that it gets widely uptake taken as a survey tool. Um, so there you see on the top right is someone walking around with a, with a magnetometer on their backpack. Um, I would like to see that that happens with gravity maybe in the next 20 years. So we have MEM systems that can actually take account of the inertia accelerations in the backpack, but still actually be able to do gravitational measurements. So you can actually do surveying by walking around in the fields. Um, and it's a kind of interesting fact that um, when you go to see a road set of roadworks, most of the holes that they dig for roadworks are exploratory. They don't really know what they're going to find because maps which are used to, to work out where to dig are usually based on Victorian maps. And there's features there like walls have been moved. So many of the, many, many of the, the, the utilities that have put been put under the ground, it's not really clear where they are. Um, so you could have a significant impact on the, the economy um, by doing better surveying before you have to actually start to get your drill out and, and, and dig, a, dig a hole. Um, so I think that's where I'd like things to see, that, that gravity sensors get widely uptaken as a, as a surveying tool. And I think, as I say, to do that, they've got to be lighter, they've got to be cheaper, and they've got to be really easy to use. And the important thing is you've got to you, you shouldn't, be, shouldn't need to have a PhD to, to have to use these devices. You should be best to, able to take them out and they operate straight off. I'll finish now. I think I'm just, hopefully didn't go on too long, but I'll finish, uh, I think, uh, happy to take any questions. So, well, I mean, I, I, think, I think it's probably common advice for everybody. Um, it's maybe something I didn't do myself, so it's always good to, to, to kind of reflect on, on, on how things really should have turned out. I, I think there's no substitute for meeting meeting new people so of course that's quite challenging at the moment but these 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 uh these types of webinars that that, that are being run I, 
I think it's always good to get out with your normal community. So some of the real kind of fun things I've done is because I've tried new things. So all the MEM stuff started because, you know, going to an event where I interacted from someone from engineering, that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So I think it's really important to, to, to kind of get out there, make yourself visible. Um, so, so of course, you, you need to position yourself properly. So as a PhD student, I guess you'll be looking for support from your supervisor and, you know, get your, hopefully your supervisor will be giving you plenty of opportunities to get out there and present your, your research. Um, I think that's really important. And if you're, if you're sort of a, a postdoc, then of course, there's, there's maybe a little bit more chance to do that. Um, get yourself known. So there's, there's no, again, no, no, no substitute for um, getting onto potentially invited talks, working on papers. Um, it's of course for students a little bit harder for, for postdocs. Um, some of my postdocs find it really useful if they have an opportunity to work on, on the, the development of grants. Because I think what's really important is that you're not stuck in your little silo of, you know, this is my lab and this is what I do. I think you need to somehow look at the bigger picture. And I think the bigger picture means, you know, understanding the role of an, what, what an academic does. So it's all about the teaching. So it's getting involved with teaching, but it's also that funding side. So, you know, what we have to do is we, we've got a research group, but we've got to keep that going. And that requires you to keep on kind of developing collaborations, developing funding. So what I've been doing certainly over this last year is, is a, a couple of my postdocs in my group, I've really got them to take the lead on, on writing grant applications. Um, so one of them was on a, on a studentship and it just gets you into that kind of mode of how do you take an idea, how do you distill it into the, 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 the kind of proposal, how do you engage with the people in the university to get the, the costings. And these are, I think these are really, you know, they're, they're not necessarily science skills, but, but they're the broader skills that you need if you want to kind of put yourself in, a, in an academic career. I think look for new opportunities. Um, you know, I, I, as I, as I sort of moved, moved through um, different, different levels of, of, um, of the, the academic system, um, I use my, my, my kind of um, learned societies links. So for me, it was naturally Institute of Physics. I mean, you're, you're on a, um, you know, the IEEE, of course, depending on your, your different sector, you might have different learned societies. But you know, I started there as a, as a member, and then I got involved with some of the topical groups, um, and then before, before, before any time, you know that you're, you're then on one of the, the kind of, um, you know, panels of, of that group and maybe you can be, I mean, I, I moved through the, the IOP gravitational physics group and I was the treasurer. And then after that, I became the chair. Um, I've recently in the last year taken over chair of IOP Scotland. And I think you're know, get, getting yourself visibility, getting into those learning societies. is just a great way to, to interact with a, with a broader community. Um, so maybe nothing that you've you've heard already, but I think just just seize those opportunities wherever possible.